Hello, everybody. This is Charlie, and this is the podcast to hell and back. And uh, welcome. Um, God, what do I want to tell you today? It's that that um, when I started doing DBT, and after I went through a, learning the first adaptation of DBT, the first major adaptation of DBT, actually, the first one was probably mine, I adapted it to an inpatient situation. But then there was, it was to the population of people with addictions. And I realized, oh, yeah, we made a big deal about adapting DBT to those with addictions and made all kinds of changes. Linehan did this. But then um, I realized that every case I had was an adaptation, that every single person I had to learn how to do DBT with. And there were adjustments to every person. So adaptation is like not the, the exception. It is the norm. If you aren't adapting it all the time, then you're applying a straitjacket and expecting people to fit into something. And actually that is not the way DBT was intended. It's a principle-based treatment to be applied to each individual. So to what we're doing today, and it's kind of a follow-up of the last two podcasts, if you uh, wanted to check back on them, if you didn't already hear them or see them, is to focus on an adaptation. And it's an adaptation to those folks that have autism. And it's like, what do you need to pay attention to? What might help you? What to be alert to when you apply DBT to somebody with autism? And so we've had two hours on that topic of autism already, and to some degree DBT. But today's focus is really to get, now take this a step further and really try to name you know, uh, you know how everybody loves these top 10 lists, you know, so that, that what are the top 10 uh, things you might consider when you're adapting DBT to autistic folks uh, that are your clients? Um, and so that's really what, what this one's about. It's like those top, the top 10, it's all about DBT. But now what we've figured out is in the discussion about this, because I have two guests I'm about ready to introduce. And we were talking before this. And one of them suggested, gosh, we have a lot to talk about. So maybe we should have a top 10 list of the hows. You know, all of you DBT people that know about what's and hows, because there are the what skills and the how skills in um, teaching mindfulness. But we want to have the hows and the what's. And the hows is how do you adapt DBT with its various principles and strategies and structures to uh, autistic folks. And then we wanna have another podcast that's on the what's you might say, which is delivery of the skills uh, because the what's are the skills. Uh, we wanna deliver the skills to people with autism. And so how do you adapt particular skills like in the four different modules? We wanna take a whole podcast on that. So this one is about how you adapt and the next one will be about with DBT skills, what you adapt. So let me introduce my guests and then I'll be quiet in a minute because I'm really gonna be the background moderator here and they are really the content experts. So maybe if you if you tuned into either of the last two podcasts, um, once again, I have Amara Brook, Dr. Amara Brook, who is a clinical psychologist in the Bay Area. Um, you know, in around uh, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, et cetera. Um, and she's been uh, a, a DBT therapist for quite some time. Uh, she also has had a specialty of working with people with autism. She also does psychological testing, diagnostic testing, and, um, and, and really has a, a practice within her practice of, of that's DBT informed. She also really has a lot of savvy and knowledge and personal knowledge that she shared stuff about the last two times uh, about working with autistic folks and, and applying DBT. Um, and so uh, welcome again, Amara, thanks for coming back. Um, thanks so much, Charlie, really excited to be here. Great. And then there's uh, Rachel Krauss is an LICSW, a psychotherapist. Oh, I, I, she shook her head, uh, which you might not be able to see, but I did. So. I, I think I got that wrong. LCSWC. LCSW. C. In, LCS. in Maryland, we have oh, extremely LC. complicated letter system. Oh, okay. Okay. It's the same idea, but different same letters. Idea. Okay. 
So she's a clinical social worker. That, that part's common denominator in these two different sets of letters. And, um, and she's uh, been a psychotherapist for a lot of years. And she, has, uh, she does a lot of work of uh, coaching people in executive functioning. She's a, a neurodiversity affirming person. Uh, she has a lot to say about people with neurodiverse, neurodiversity and adapting DBT to autism. And, uh, and, and so, and she has uh, been a colleague of Amara for some time and friend. And so um, I'm really happy to have you on the podcast and excited to hear what the two of you have to say. So thanks, Rachel, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really, really excited to be doing this. I think it's really important. Good. All right. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, I'm going to basically hand this over to Amara and to Rachel, and I'm gonna bring in, uh, now and then I may ask a question or, or say something about timing or keep us on track basically, because they have a lot to say. And, uh, I'm gonna, and they've, they've done some work of what topics they wanna cover. And when I say we've got a sort of a top 10 list here, I mean, who knows, it might be 12, it might be 19, please don't count and hold us to it. But um, basically that's the idea. So. I'm going to just step off there and 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 ask Amara. Uh, did, did you want to get started with making some preliminary comments? Uh, that was what I understood, but I really don't know for sure. So it's it's your ball game. Sure, that sounds good. Um, so we wanted to preface with a few things. Um, I know people may have various different degrees of familiarity with autism and you know what that looks like. As Charlie and I discussed on the couple episodes ago, there's a lot of stereotypes about autism and there's different realities. Um, but generally involves, you know, differences in social communication and um, there's some cognitive, um, how kind of how we process the world differences. Um, sensory differences and several other things that Rachel and I will allude to. Um, but I, for preface, I just wanted to say that these are general suggestions, like general ways that it's helpful to um, adapt DBT. And um, autistic people do not necessarily all have the same needs. For example, some like me, I'm an autistic person and also have ADHD. Um, I do really well with auditory only communication. Like I love audiobooks, I love podcasts without video. I actually find the video distracting, although it is lovely to see Charlie and Rachel as always. Um, you know, other people really need the the visual. They really need the video. They really need, you know, they don't do well with just auditory only. And that's just one little tiny example of where autistic people can be really different. People can have different sensory needs and et cetera. And we'll talk about lots of those things. But just wanted to preface by saying we don't all have the same needs. You've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Um, and so this is not going to be just kind of a cookbook. It's going to be guidelines. And it's most important, as Charlie suggested in the intro, to learn what your client needs, including their autisticness, if that's part of their neurotype, including their ADHD, if that's part of their neurotype, including any other things that are part of their needs and adapt accordingly. Um, so, you know, take, take what works and most importantly, adapt to the specific needs of your client. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Rachel for a moment. She's going to mention another kind of big picture thing before we get yeah, started. Yeah, just, um, basically what helps autistic clients is also going to actually help other clients potentially, um, autistic folks, we've, they've sometimes been referred to as the canary in the coal mine. So what's kind of annoying for you may be unbearable for me. And if we accommodate my needs by removing that annoying thing, you're gonna benefit as well. Um, so just kind of also remembering that we talk about today isn't necessarily just going to be helpful to your autistic clients. It may actually benefit everyone. So, Amara, did you wanna get started with the top 10-ish? I have one Thanks. more preface thing and then we'll get going with the top 10. Um, okay. So just wanted to say not all adaptations may be needed for every client because their needs will be different and there may be different things that are feasible for different practices. So I just wanted to preface by saying that because just because you can't maybe can't uh, make every single modification that we're talking about and certainly nobody can modify everything immediately because that's just not realistic. Um, you know, take what you can do and kind of leave the rest. And if you have the opportunity over time, try to do better, right? I think we're all familiar with that kind of 
approach as, um, you know, DBT therapists, like do the best you can and try to do better as the opportunity may arise. You know, for example, you might have limited ability. When I worked in some settings like schools or hospitals, I had virtually no ability to control, say, sensory aspects of the office environment or group meeting rooms. Um, that might not be something that you can do at the moment, but that could be something you could consider in the future, maybe if you had that opportunity. Um, or you just focus on other aspects of what we're saying. Um, or, you know, formats that you use for coaching. Some people may have the opportunity to use different formats for coaching, and some people that may be determined by the policies of their uh, clinical setting, and that's okay, right? So just kind of do what you can and, and leave the rest and, you know, continue adapting and modifying as you can over time. Um, all right. Um, so without further ado, um, jump into the first of the top 10 uh, kind of how skills for how to adapt DBT for autistic folks. Um, the first number one, validation, validation, and more validation. Um, now, as DBT therapists, you might be thinking, of course, I'm always extremely validating. That's what we do as DBT therapists. Um, and, I, and I don't doubt that that is true. Um, at the same time, we can be unintentionally invalidating if we don't understand how our client is processing the world or what their personal differences are or what group they're part of and what those differences look like. So we're talking about being really, really um, humble and when in doubt, be validating, right? So if you're having the urge to think, oh, this is one of those times when I need to be a little bit invalidating to like really push my client, be really careful about that. You know, autistic clients may be really different in a lot of ways than other clients that you've worked with. Um, autistic clients like clients with uh, who are borderline that you may have worked with have usually been traumatically invalidated throughout their lives, right? We autistic people have a lot of differences in terms of processing and seeing the world. And a lot of times we've been surrounded either by people who don't have those differences and therefore don't understand, or by um, people who maybe even do have those differences, but feel like they need to force us to fit into a typical mold because otherwise things are gonna be terrible, right? So there's a lot of reasons that, we, that most of us have been traumatically invalidated in many ways throughout our lives. Um, Autistic folks often see things very differently than you might if you're not autistic, or even if you are autistic, because maybe your neurotype is just a bit different. They may see things very differently from your other clients. So if your client gets stuck, um, you know, assume good intentions, like we always try to do in DBT, and good effort, like doing the best they can, right? And work with them to figure out what skills, what, what dialectic of acceptance and change, um, is, might be helpful to them. Um, I would say many times that involve the, the traditional approach that's been taken with autistic people through um, have been mostly change oriented therapies because autism has been seen, unfortunately, historically as a collection of deficits that need to be changed to get people to fit more into the non autistic or allistic world. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on changing autistic people and not so much on accepting their differences. Um, and so I'd say, you know, probably part of this modification involves more acceptance and perhaps less change than you might have the instinct to do when you first meet this person and observe their differences. Um, so again, validation, validation, validation. Um, be and stay curious rather than making assumptions based on how you are or how your other clients are, or, and I know this is tricky, even how the client may present on the surface, because many of us, in order to reduce trauma, have, like some other DBT clients, learned to suppress our needs and mask in order to look more neurotypical but that may not actually be the reality. So be and stay curious rather than making assumptions, even just based on what you see on the surface. And again, validate, validate, validate. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel for the, the next item, which is very closely related to this first one. Um, and Rachel, I'll take it away. Yeah, um, just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying that, you know, autism is included uh, in addition to being 
viewed as a, a collection of deficits, you know, it's historically been seen as behavioral, that it's a, these behaviors and um, it's not a behavioral issue, it's about wiring the brain, it's about neurotype. Um, so one of the words I've been using and, and one of the kind of the top 10 things I would encourage folks, especially allistic therapists and allistic being non-autistic, um, is this word neurohumility, which I thought I'd put together until I Googled it and like other people are using it. Um, but the way I've been using it is kind of this extension of cultural humility, which basically means that I as a therapist recognize and act as if even though me and this client are moving through the same world and we may even actually share a neurotype, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my way, I could never assume that my way of understanding and perceiving the world is exactly the same as yours. It would kind of be presumptuous to even assume that. Um, a client is the expert in their own life and we need to communicate that we understand that respectfully. Um, Autistic folks have been long been seen accused of being rigid. Um, in a lot of ways, that rigidity can and is a trauma response that keeps them safe. And in order to learn and become flexible, our clients, well, they really have to feel safe first. Um, they need to be understood. They need to feel understood. And then they need to feel cared about. And that's when they're going to allow themselves to become vulnerable in a way that lets them have the flexibility to learn new ways of doing things that just may be more efficacious in, in pursuit of their goals. And that's one of the things we wanna do in, in DBT is allow people to have access to those skills. But again, we have to, like you said, lead with validation and there are some ways to do that. Um, you know, We have these basic assumptions in treatment that this is a real relationship between equal people. Um, and these clients, you know, they've been traumatically invalidated by ableism, which kind of touches each and every place in our lives. So again, with emotional myths and having to learn new ways and unlearn the myths, at the same time, they're being subconsciously fed to us everywhere we go, ableism is no exception. Um, and our clients, because they've been living in this reality, they, they're either on the defense uh, more readily or they're gonna utilize that fawn, that people pleasing response. And we need to convey our neurohumility through the language we use. So how do we do this? Um, you know, we're going to reflect, we're going to reframe, and we're also going to invite the client's dissent. So what I mean by this is we're going to always reflect, we're going to reframe, we're going to provide information in a, uh, in a question form. So like if a client's telling me about an experience and my response is, wow, that must have been so scary. And, and the client's like, well, no, in their head, it wasn't scary. It was really fun. And I was so proud. And then this therapist thinks it must have been scary. And I want them to like me or even believe me. So I'll disagree. Yeah, it was scary. Versus me saying something like, I could imagine that was a scary experience. Is that what it was like for you? And by asking it as a question, we're inviting the client, we're permitting the client to disagree. And they're also hearing that I'm trying to understand um, that we're checking that what we understand, that what we think we understand is what they have actually communicated. Um, another way to validate is and, and to convey neurohumility is essentially being authentic in our own experience, which is part of DBT, is that part of being a DBT therapist, we're acknowledging our own limitations. Um, while there's going to be limitations in our setting, we really need to make sure we're being honest with our clients about why we're asking for certain things, not in, like inventing arbitrary policies or shoving rules on clients inflexibly. And even this is addressed in our DBT manual that being inflexible is not always the most effective way, um, especially if those rules, the, that inflexibility on our part is to get our own needs met. We're just gonna be radically authentic with our clients. We're gonna say, this is my limitation. Um, that's how we're gonna gain trust. And then we're also gonna be able to set those limits when we need to. Um, and then the last piece in here is that when a client says, I can't, that we're believing them, that we're not pushing, you know, we have this trauma as we move through the world of try harder, try harder, try harder. 
And by not leading with validation, by not um, believing immediately, you can't, you've tried it. We as therapists, we're gonna perpetuate that trauma. Oh, the therapist doesn't believe me either when I say I can't. We're gonna go back. We're gonna say, okay, you can't. We're gonna problem solve. The problem solving doesn't work. We're gonna go back to those four options for solving any problem. And we can talk more about that in our next, uh, how we do it, what we're doing. Is it the how next time? Um, it's the why. The what, sorry. But the last piece I have in here is essentially like embracing these questions, answering all the questions, encouraging questions. Um, a lot of times autistic folks are looking for precision, precise wording to, and precise understanding. Um, historically, autistic folks can be, when they ask questions to understand, it can be seen as a challenge to authority and people don't like that. And what we're doing is we're stepping in and we're helping them feel safe to understand the way they need to by inviting these questions, by, by asking them and by answering them. And you know, it might feel like to you, these questions are excessive. However, what you're doing is you're validating. Bring me all your questions. I wanna help you understand this is neuro humility in action is even if you feel it's excessive, please bring the, me the questions. And this can translate later if all those questions are not effective in one area. Once our client trusts us, we are gonna be able to help them figure out other ways of navigating certain environments. So. Great. Hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna pose a question to the two of you based on what you just both said. Um, and, and I realize that in our dialogue here or trialogue or whatever it is when three people talk, um, and that uh, that I I'm I guess I'm the allistic one, and uh, so so as the allistic person who's a therapist, and let's say I was treating a person who I knew maybe or probably or has some signs that they have autism. Okay, and I want to be validating as a DBT therapist. I want to, and that means I have to actually know my client because you have to understand somebody to be validating and validating to understand them. So it's um, uh, but let's but but there's but but the person who is sitting in front of me in my office is somebody who has spent their life masking their deficits or their problems or their neurotype or however you're thinking they they feel like they're they're in a world of of ableism that has required that they mask things that are part of who they are so that's going to be a real challenge for me as a therapist who doesn't know who they are, didn't go through that with them. And now I don't know that actually this person in front of me, as I mentioned in one of the previous podcasts, was, for instance, a young man, a teenage boy who actually never thought in words. He only thought in movies and pictures. And so I didn't know that. Once I learned that, it totally changed how we interacted with each other. But I didn't know that until well into working with him. There's been other people, another person I worked with was a young woman who had been in college around here and it turns out to be autistic. And she would, um, she would, she, we talked about emotions in DBT, the, all these different emotions and experience of emotion. It was way later in treatment that she said, I have to tell you, Charlie, I actually don't even understand what any of these emotions are. I don't think I have them. I think we've been talking about them for like two years. And so there must be a million things like that. So would you recommend, what, if you're gonna be validating, you actually have to know the person and what's behind the mask when somebody's masking. Are there tips that you have for getting behind that mask? Should you be doing what you do when you go to a thorough doctor's office and fill out a questionnaire where they ask you like these 400 questions about every single system in your body? I mean, what about all the sensory communication, the experiences, should we be doing a screening at the beginning of treatment to find out who has what? Any comments about this? I know it's a huge question and I don't know if there's really a huge answer. I'd love to frame it in terms of a dialectic, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Because I, I think that it really behooves all of us, like working with any diverse group or cultural group to have some knowledge of that group. It's on the one hand, not fair to expect the client to carry the burden of educating us from complete ignorance into understanding their neurotype. It's helpful for us to take it upon ourselves to 
learn something ahead of time and have some cultural competence with autistic people. Um, and we need to stay curious and be really open. And I am not always one for encouraging sort of behavioral strategies, but I would say this is one place where we need to make sure that we are reversing their lifetime of experience being punished for being open and asking questions. Like early on, we want to get really curious and say, hey, please let me know anytime I'm wrong. And I really mean that. And they're probably going to be like, oh, sure you do, because nobody really means that. I get punished for that all the time. And then we need to think, well, if I really want to know about them and I really want them to be open, then you see, tell me, can you tell me in the first five minutes, like something that I'm getting wrong? Like, is there anything you can think of that I've gotten wrong already? Right. And then be like, I am so glad you told me. Thank you so much. Cause I would have had literally no idea and I would have kept doing that to you. And I really don't want to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we need to like set the stage where like we are all about encouraging them to be open and authentic and being really mindful for ourselves. How do I reinforce that every time they do it rather than accidentally sort of punishing them in the way that they've probably experienced throughout their lives? So again, the dialectic I think is we need to take it upon ourselves to develop cultural competence with autistic people and not assume that different that what we think the typical autistic person is like is a good fit for this person. We need to stay really, really curious and then be really positive and affirming whenever they correct us and help us learn. So, okay, thank and you. Rachel, I, I don't know if you have anything to, you're welcome to add anything you'd like to that. I think just going back to the initial question also about like assessments, et cetera, et cetera. I think there are certain things as we get to know our clients that they may not know about themselves. And sometimes it's that we need to also give words. Mm -hmm. So I do sensory profiles, sensory assessments, or I at least ask every new client I work with about sensory sensitivities, whether or not they are autistic or might be autistic, but don't know that they might be autistic or are just not autistic. I'm still doing asking those questions. And I've had plenty of folks say, no one's ever asked me this. I do it with my executive function coaching clients too, because of the way that emotional regulation being essential for executive functioning um, interplays with the sensory experience. And so we need to know this information. Um, I also ask about learning style because when we're uh, either leading a DBT group or even just teaching DBT skills individually, um, we wanna present the skills in the way the person best learns. They may not know, so you can kind of ask a little bit about what it was like going through school. What was the most effective in helping you remember things? What just didn't work at all? So we can get a sense of how this person learns. So we can present the information to them in the way they can best receive it. I mean, our, our job is not to push them to learn differently at this time. It's more, how do I teach you these skills as efficaciously as possible? Okay, thank you guys. I'll let you go ahead and into the, I guess, the third tip or whatever we're all calling right. it. Yeah. So, all right. So number three um, of our top 10, uh, um, how to adapt DBT for autistic folks. And what did, we wanted to talk a little bit about goal setting um, because very often I'll see the question of like, okay, how do I adapt DBT to treat autism? And that is not the right place to start. Um, autism is not the target. Autism is a valid, different neurotype, and we want to make sure that we're starting from that frame to say that autism itself, which is a core part of many autistic people's identities, um, or at least if they have sort of it healthy, uh, it's healthy for it to be a core part of their identities. Um, although we can't really tell anybody how they should identify, but autism, we should not assume that autism is the target, right? Autistic people are different in a variety of ways from non-autistic people, but just like any other client coming into DBT, we want to be helping them pursue their life worth living goals, not just kind of ableism or shoulds that they have received from others, or even our own beliefs about what would make their life better, right? We really want the goals to be the client's own personal 
life worth living goals and not to assume that the goal is to treat or change autism, just like we wouldn't, if we have a, you know, a gay client come into DBT, probably these days, most of us would not be starting with, and we're, oh good, I have a gay client. How do I use autism to treat, sorry, how do I use DBT to treat gayness, right? Like we're not doing conversion therapy for gay people and we shouldn't be doing conversion therapy for autistic people either. Mm -hmm. um, so we're focusing on the client's life worth living goals helping them mindfully discover what their own life worth living goals are. If maybe they've been referred to us by, you know, an assessor who heard, oh yeah, you know, DBT is good for autistic people. I'll refer them to DBT to treat their autism, right? We want to start out helping them discern their own life worth living goals, helping them clarify that and not having that driven by, you know, the assessment psychologist agenda or other people in their lives agenda or our agenda or anything like that. Right. So it's about the client's own life worth living goals and helping them get there. Um, and just not assuming that the goals that other people have or that other people in their lives have are their goals, right? Like just being super open to discovery of what their goals and us helping them get to those goals. Um, I think I'm going to uh, cut myself off there for this particular item and hand it over to Rachel um, for the next top 10. Right. Actually, the, the thing I wanted to add there, though, it's, it's funny because sometimes you'll get someone coming in saying, yeah, I want to not be this thing. Anymore. I, I don't want to be autistic anymore. I don't I've been doing this for a long time, been in lots of therapists, and, and I usually just kind of use that. I, I go, I'm going to Dr. Phil you right now. Like, how's that working? And then really just allow them to kind of explore how trying really hard to be something that you are biologically not made up to be is working for them. And oftentimes we start moving into the radical acceptance of this is how you're put together. This is your biology. This is the limitation that you have. And what are your other goals and how can we work together to get there without trying to change this part of how you're wired? So a lot of times people like it when, you know, you kind of call out what you're doing rather than just using therapist speak. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a therapist now. Um, so diary card modifications would be our, our fourth one. Just what do we do with this diary card? You know, I, I don't know how many of, uh, of y'all have diary cards just being the bane of people's existence. How do we do it? How do we? Um, so a couple of very quick things. Sometimes it can be really, really hard for autistic folks to either A, remember their emotions, or if they're not actively experiencing right there, or B, really get into a record scale and be like, I don't know what number I am. I'm, I, I'm just angry. I'm a 10. I'm always a 10 at angry. Um, so really just looking at how we're structuring these diary cards that were really flexible. Um, and, you know, we can do, we can ask them, can you do a Likert scale? Can you tell me where you are one to 10, one to five? Sometimes we can just use a binary. You either were angry or you weren't that day. You felt joy or you didn't. Um, sometimes they want a really specific Likert scale. So like, I don't know, I'm like a 6.321. We could do a one to 100. We do what works for the client. And sometimes our clients don't um, relate to those emotional words, anger, joy, pride. So we can actually say, I feel green. I feel bubbles. I feel, and then describe the movement. And if that's a targeted um, emotion, we can just put that on the card. We're just going to try to identify what seems most efficacious to assist the client in gathering data. So that they can relate to and asking them to fit, sorry, gathering data that they can relate to rather than asking them to fit and conform to words that don't resonate. Yeah, so I just wanna add to that or uh, I, I wanna, um, I wanna just say that in working with other populations, including a deaf and hard of hearing population, uh, I was coaching a team in Eastern Massachusetts that had come up with a way to rate emotions, which was much more just a, like a color wheel. 
and they identified you know, the intensity of a color as the intensity of an emotion. And people who couldn't say that they had this level of intensity of anger, zero to five, this level of intensity of misery, zero to five, they were able to identify this color red uh, as opposed to this faint red versus this pink color you know, as really representing. So it was interesting. And at that stage, I wasn't really thinking about things like autism or neurodiversity. I just thought, isn't it interesting that these people actually are much better at rating the intensity of a color than the intensity of an emotion and how different we are. And they had figured that out already in this program in Westboro, Massachusetts. And, uh, and it worked very well for them. And they, they showed it when they taught about their DBT program. Um, Thanks, Charlie. Um, I think I'm gonna to jump to the next of the sort of top 10 things. And this is a really big one. These are in no particular order, by the way. We, you know, it was hard to figure out an order that made sense, but differences in communication are one of the core differences in autism. Even in terms of how we diagnose, half of our criteria are differences in communication and relationships. Um, and there's a, a few things that I want to highlight here. Um, so one is a lot of types of therapy, including DBT, really heavily lean on verbal speech. So expressing ourselves through verbal speech and receiving verbal speech. Um, and for some autistic people, that it, there are differences in terms of verbal speech, right? So the most obvious <laughs> is some people... Um, don't uh, communicate through verbal speech at all. Those are the people that people think of as nonverbal or non-speaking. Um, there are other ways to communicate. Like people used to assume that if somebody didn't communicate with verbal speech, that they weren't smart or that they didn't have anything to communicate. And now we know better. There are people who do not communicate through verbal speech because of say apraxia, which is where somebody is um, body and brain cannot make verbal speech, but it doesn't mean that they don't have thoughts to share. Um, so it really, there are other people who do communicate through verbal speech, but there may be differences on their speech. So it may take them longer to formulate their thoughts, right, and to get them out. They may that the way what they say may not mean exactly what you think it means based on a non-autistic perspective. Right. So even for people who do seem verbally fluent and articulate, um, there may be differences in their verbal speech communication. Um, so we really want to be to offer um, alternative communication options when we're helping autistic folks. So obviously, if there's somebody who doesn't use verbal speech or has difficulty using verbal speech, sometimes people are articulate, sometimes and other times they lose their ability to speak. We want to offer other options like in a chat, uh, you know, chat in an online format, or for example, if you have an online group allowing people to participate via chat rather than just verbally. Um, if we're in the office, allowing people to communicate through paper and pencil or through a whiteboard or a chalkboard or something like that. Um, things like that. So, and this is not necessarily only, again, just for people who never communicate verbally, but just offering those options so that people have more ways that they can communicate. Um, in coaching, some people do offer the option of coaching through messaging of some sort, like text or signal for, or WhatsApp or something like that. Of course, you want to use something that, that is secure. Um, but some people are better able to reach out for coaching or benefit from coaching if they have an alternative communication option other than just over the phone, which for a lot, not all autistic people, I personally love over the phone, but for some other people, they really have a hard time with that type of a format. So we want to make sure that we're really mindful of modes of communication and are there other alternative communication options that would um, better enable this client to participate and benefit from DBT. Um, I would say the, the other big thing besides verbal, nonverbal, is many autistic people communicate directly. We tend to say what we mean, literally, and not to necessarily be communicating with lots of hidden, subtle hints type of things. And if a non-autistic therapist is assuming 
that the DB, that the autistic person is communicating in a neurotypical, you know, hidden, sudden, you know, sudden, subtle hint type of way. They may be reading all kinds of things that are not intended into what the autistic person says. They might be concluding that the autistic person's statements are rude rather than just direct. That's something that's been put on many of us. Like they said that and, you know, non-autistic people read all kinds of sort of intentions and emotions and um, things like slights and whatever into autistic people just being direct. And the flip side of that is when we're communicating with autistic people, be direct. Don't assume that they can read between the lines or get a subtle hint, right? I've heard um, non-autistic therapists talk about, um, and sometimes autistic ones too, communicating, they're, they're intending to communicate through their body language in a session. And this really speaks to how we cannot make across the board assumptions about differences in body language. Like Rachel and I had to talk about this. Like, so for some autistic people, they're just not really like making a lot of body language like at all. Um, or they may make something out of the body language, but it may not be the same thing that the non-autistic therapist intended to communicate with their body language. Um, so, or there may be a delay before the client is able to, you know, make something of that body language. So we just need to be really aware that there can be both verbal and nonverbal communication differences with autistic clients. And generally we're better off communicating pretty directly and just being aware again, being curious, inquiring, checking for understanding, right? In a really non-judgmental way um, with the clients to, you know, help kind of compensate for those communication differences and not reading things into the differences in their communication. If they're not making eye contact, if they're looking away, if they're you know, wearing a hat or sunglasses, if they're, you know, fidgeting or doodling or, or coloring or, you know, having their camera off or not talking, not to assume that those things communicate what we might think that they communicate. It may just be that person having communication differences and maybe even hearing better by, you know, doing their doodling or their coloring or they're looking the other direction. Um, so there are a wide range of communication differences, and the more we can be aware of and non-judgmental and curious about that and adapt, the better for um, for autistic clients and really for all clients, but especially be aware with autistic clients because we know that there are lots of communication differences um, with autistic folks. So, Amara, I want I want to make a comment about this. This is I, you just what you just said just set off like. A lot of things. I won't. Um, I won't comment on most of it. I have to take this and run with it myself. <laughs> In fact, some of the things you guys are saying has made me consider one one of my children and whether he has more of these characteristics than I thought. I mean, when I start to hear some of these things, because he he may have masked his whole life, but he he wouldn't communicate in certain ways even as a five year old at his Montessori school when the teacher would wanna shake hands and say, good morning, welcome to the classroom, he would practically run out of the building. I mean, mm -hmm. and, he would, and he'd be willing to climb in the window in the back in order to avoid that. But he has other ways of communicating a lot. So, but I also wanna say, it, it, it makes me think, of course, this is way more broad than just autism itself in these different ways of communicating, that when I teach workshops, and I've come now over the last, the Zoom workshops of the last three years to find that when I, when I give everybody on the workshop, I tell them, look, you can just communicate by chat throughout this workshop. You don't need to uh, wait to say something, all right? You can talk to each other, the whole thing. And in a way, what I found happens is a parallel workshop goes on, is that people start to really communicate. And some people who never say anything in the actual uh, in verbal, oral form are typing like crazy and they're really asking great questions and they're answering each other's questions and then they're posing a question. It's sort of like you're creating another culture within a culture and then that chat culture be, get, gets then read by the person who's the teacher like me. And then I start to realize, oh my God, there's this other level of communication going on here. And so now I give free reign to that. I say, guys, 
you're getting two workshops in one, more than you thought you were paying for. Like you get two workshops here, or maybe it's more than that. Because if you had another forum in which people were drawing pictures rather than, uh, and they were doing kind of artwork, I mean, who knows? Or, and you had the musicians are communicating what they're hearing in the conversation. You just start to break open and realize the number of ways of communicating or with your body, but not with your body if you're just on the phone. It's, it's, uh, so I was thinking that and thinking now I'm, I'm going to go into a whole new era of having mindfulness practices in my skills group about different ways of communicating, like communicate by pictures. Let's do a five minute practice of communicating to each other and nobody can say a word. Uh, we're just going to draw pictures for each other, or you can only communicate through texting. Uh, we're not going to say anything out loud and see what, and just notice the differences. So thank you for your, I mean, that's just a, a little bit. It was a very, what you guys are saying so far is, is very interesting, you know, thank you. Thank you, Charlie, for those, those comments. Um, I also want to, I realize I forgot to say one thing with that part. And I just really want to mention it is that when people do, when narcissistic people do communicate verbally, and or non-verbally, often, I, I did mention that people read into their, but I want to give a couple of examples. One is tone. A lot of autistic people have differences in their tone when they communicate mm. and are not able to hear or control that tone, especially when they're discussing anything that's emotional at all, which is like, let's say everything in DBT. Um, so we, there's a lot, many times that autistic people are um, thought to be rude or even disciplined or other people make like rules for meetings that are supposedly like using a nice tone that that person is not even able to hear or communicate. We need to be super careful not to read things in to those differences that are just, you know, not there. You could say, oh, I noticed that your tone changed. Are, are you upset with me about something? And then you could say, no, my tone's fine. You know, and you can say, okay, well, you know, and there, you probably will notice if you work with them over time that like maybe they're consistently louder or maybe sometimes their tone's different, but we want to make sure that we're not reading um, non-autistic assumptions into that. Mm -hmm. um, another is eye contact. Like eye contact is a non-autistic norm that is very difficult for many autistic people and for many autistic people interferes with their ability to think or process information. Mm -hmm. And if we're privileging the comfort of the uh, non-autistic therapist or other people in the room over the autistic person and trying to force eye contact, then we're just making them mask like everywhere else. And we're probably interfering with their learning as well. So we just want to make sure really super sure that we're not inflicting those non-autistic norms, like um, sort of like soft tone or, you know, eye contact that may be really interfere with their ability to fully participate and learn. Um, and on top of that, be invalidated again, right? Just like they have been in other parts of their lives. Mm. Mm. Um, Rachel, I wanted to hand it over to you to uh, talk about sensory considerations. Our number six, sensory. Okay. Apologies, I had to run off for a minute. Uh, to no take problem. Um, it, it, one reflection on, on something Charlie had mentioned though. Um, thank, thank you, Mara, because it's, it's also kind of this argument of, of building in just more inclusivity into our DBT. Um, one of the groups I was working with, a non-DBT group, a couple of days ago, actually, we were talking about this viral TikTok that went out there of this teacher of probably kindergarten first graders. Um, and she has this chart on the wall and each, there was some music going, and each kid as they would enter the room would touch a picture on the chart it's a heart or a, I, I can't remember what the other pictures are. And that would signal the way the child wanted to say hello, whether it was a hug or a high five or a bow or a dance move. And you watch these, these kids funnel through and they, each one is a little bit different. I think the dance move was the most popular in this particular class. But again, it's a way of being inclusive, not prioritizing or, um, yeah, prioritizing one person's comfort breeding. Mm. Rather, it's giving the kid an opportunity to say, this one is the most comfortable for me. And the teacher who created the chart is obviously, or, or one would hope, not gonna put anything that causes her discomfort on there. Mm. Um, so it meets both needs. And so I thought that was pretty cool. And, and your That's story very cool. reminded me of that. Of I, wish, I, I wish they did that when, when my son went to school at that place, because he, he would have had lots of, very cool ways to enter the room, but the normal conventional handshake was not his thing, you know. 
yeah. yeah. If they did hip hop on the way in the room, he would have been all right, actually. Mm -hmm. He would have done just fine. <laughs> just with the fine. Teacher. Just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On to sensory. So talking about sensory, because you can't talk about autistic folks and not talk about sensory sensitivities, hyper or hypo, meaning like very, very sensitive or actually not sensitive at all to the point where you don't even notice. So I think Amara in the past couple of podcasts, you talk a bit about the eight sensory systems. We have eight systems, not just five, um, but just kind of a, a brief. The additional three include proprioception, which is this kinesthetic knowledge, um, knowing where our body is in space. And then there's an integration of a visual piece there. Um, there is also a pro, uh, not proprioception, I'm sorry, uh, the vestibular sense, which has to do with um, our sense of balance and our inner ear. And finally, interoception, which has to do, do with kind of knowing what's going on inside our body, feeling hungry, feeling like we have to use the bathroom, actually feeling pain. Um, I work with some autistic folks who really don't feel most types of pain for a couple of different reasons, um, mm. but that's tied to their interoceptive knowledge. Mm. Um, and the uh, sensory systems are really directly tied to our ability to regulate our emotions. Um, we talk a lot about emotional regulation in DBT because when we're understimulated or overstimulated in an area, it can be overwhelming. It can cause um, that dysregulation. Um, we talk about autistic folks, again, being the canary in the coal mine, when that screams out, uh, when you know everyone else is kind of annoyed, but the autistic person really just can't even be there. So how do we address this? I'm just some water in. Um, you know, the first thing is, again, like I was talking about before, creating a sensory profile for all of our clients. What does that look like? It's just asking about our different sensory input, you know, knowing the questions to ask and helping them identify, oh, yeah, actually, I really just don't do well in that type of environment. I thought it was just me. Nope, no, you're just overstimulated in this one area. Or you last about this amount of time before you just can't anymore. Um, and then we can really build this into our skills. You know, we have our self-soothe and our accept skill um, where we're gonna really also talk about those eight systems, not just the five in both self-soothe and accept. Um, and then, you know, people may or may not know in the podcast, uh, one of the things that I do is I add an S onto the please skill, making it pleases. And that S stands for balancing our sensory input. So if we're trying to regulate our emotions and we feel we're pretty balanced in all the other areas, we're also looking at, oh yeah, but I'm also exposing myself to all this noise all day. And maybe that's what's dysregulating me. Maybe I need to be using some kind of noise blockers. Maybe I need to be taking more breaks and getting away from all the sound. Um, and then when um, I've historically introduced that skill, we'll actually take a group meeting and we'll together create sensory profiles, even if we've already discussed this individually, because that way the group members can kind of play off of each other. Oh yeah, I'm like that too. Or I never thought of that, but you know what? So they're learning from each other as much as they're learning from me. Cause again, we don't know what we don't know. If I don't know to ask, maybe someone else has that. Um, we're also bringing sensory factors into our chain analysis and our missing link analysis um, to help people better identify some of those behaviors and where they could be coming from. And then um, finally, just considering sensory factors in our office spaces and our groups, just to the extent possible, when we're setting up our groups, if possible, trying to have people who don't have competing sensory needs in a group. Um, then, you know, having different lighting options and allowing our clients to figure out what works best for them. And because we're the ones setting up the lighting options, we're not going to put anything that is intolerable for us in there. Um, asking clients not to use perfume or smoke before coming into our office space for group or individual. Also, because that, those smells kind of linger. Um, and then, you know, like covering up if we have like a really cluttered area where we keep all our fidgets, covering that up unless the client wants to see the fidget bowl. Because that visual clutter can be really distracting for a lot of people or for some people. Um, you know, having multiple seating options minimizing or eliminating people eating food with a strong odor in our office spaces if we allow eating um, having an air purifier if possible to keep the scent as neutral as possible in our office spaces um, with communication assistance um, just kind of being aware that with whiteboards there's an odor to those markers um, 
with chalkboards, you know, that chalk dust can be really difficult for some people. So just kind of being aware of these things, asking people, maybe using a pen and paper for alternative communication, if it's an in-person group when, you know, instead of a whiteboard or chalk. Again, it's just checking with your client. And the last piece is stimming. Um, stimming is historically uh, associated with autistic folks. It's using sensory, it's, it's um, on purpose putting sensory information, stimulating our, our sensory systems for the purpose of um, regulating our emotions, grounding. Um, in DBT, we don't realize it, but we teach stimming. We actually teach it. When we're teaching self-soothe, we're teaching stimming. Um, everybody stims. Autistic folks just kind of do it in annoying or unusual or just no, more noticeable ways than other people. And that's how they've kind of gotten that reputation. Um, they may need it more than other people to regulate. Rachel, our, our... So Rachel, when you say that, what, what for instance, that we might teach in self-soothing that somebody might not have thought of as stimming, are, okay. are you talking about? So let me think. Because when I, the, the immediate thought that came in my mind was the proprioceptive input. For self-soothing, when we soothe a baby, we rock them. You may see somebody rocking themselves. That is a form of stimming. That is a grounding, self-soothing um, way of movement. That's proprioceptive and a bit of vestibular input. I'm rocking right now for the people who are watching the, the YouTube. Um, that is a way of grounding and in, uh, bringing in a sensory system. I'm trying to think, what else do we do? We listen to music. We're mm -hmm. activating our auditory sensory system. And if we find that music soothing, we are using it to stim in that way. If we're looking at something that brings us pleasure to calm ourselves down, that is using our visual to in uh, bring in a sensory input. Um, I think that, that really comes up in groups. Sorry, if it, I don't mean to be rude interrupting, but um, you know, some people need to doodle or color or something like that in group. And we may notice that. And we like even yesterday when I was reviewing the previous podcast, I cannot just sit in a chair and listen to it. Like I just can't keep myself focused. So I had a, you know, page from an adult coloring book and some pens, and I was coloring the page while I was listening to the previous podcast. And by doing that, I'm able to keep my attention focused by having that that visual input kind of occupying that channel and kind of, I sort of had an optimal level of stimulation with the visual that was kind of not really taking up too much space, taking up that sensory channel. And then I could really focus in on the auditory and many times, you know, either DBT group leaders or other teachers that a person may have had may assume that those other activities that they're doing are just being distracted or not paying attention when that is the farthest thing from the truth, because we can actually pay attention better if we're meeting those sensory needs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when it, and thank you for bringing that up actually, because sometimes what I talk about it, when I talk about it um, with my executive function people is we actually talk about it as white noise, right? If I'm trying to sit totally still and I'm focusing on sitting still and I'm working on something and, you know, I have an itch or something, it's going to intrude into my, I have to itch that, I have to move, I have to do this, I have to do that. Um, so if I'm rocking while I'm, for example, working on something, um, it may almost be like that sensory input white noise, if you will. So I'm not going to notice as much if there's a, you know, a small twitch on my leg. Does that make sense how I'm explaining it? Because it actually helps us with that one mindfulness. If I'm moving, I can actually focus my mind on that one thing at a time better than if I'm trying, having half my mind sit still, sit still, let me focus. You know, I, um, I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's really making me realize that I was doing this throughout college when I had to write a paper. I would never sit in my room and write it. I would never sit in the library and write it. I would always go to an all night cafe uh, and where there were a couple of 24 hour cafes nearby. And I would go sit there and drink tea and write like from 10 p.m. until the wee hours of the morning until I finished my paper. And it was very helpful to me to have all this stuff going on around me, people coming and going, and I would look up. It wasn't like I was moving my own body as a form of stimming, but in a way it's perceptual stimming or whatever you would call it, because I actually functioned better. I could focus better because the environment around me was actually doing stuff, but not so much stuff that it's totally distracted me. It had to be the right amount of stuff. So 
a, th a two in the morning cafe atmosphere was pretty good for me to write a paper, but not a library. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've been I, the same way with coffee shops. I mean, I wrote most of my dissertation in coffee shops. Really? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this this way of of defining stimming this way because stimming in the world of those of us who don't usually use that term sounds pathological, but actually, what you're describing something that's much more broad uh, than than a narrow group of people using a certain thing. Maybe it's more obvious. There's certain kinds of things that stand out, but but it's but put in this context, you depathologize the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Historically, when autistic folks will, will use the extremely stereotypical flapping hands, spinning in circles, right? Right, right. These are forms of stimming to regulate emotions. And when we really, really try to have kids suppress these things and don't introduce an alternative that meets the same need, just for our own comfort, yeah. you know, the kids are going to be more frequently melting down. Yeah. because they are not able to better regulate themselves. And honestly, uh, it's my understanding that a lot of times folks who are either socialized females and female birth um, are missed in a lot of autistic assessments or historically were is because our stems are more like, I'm going to sit here and do this to my hair. I'm going to like rub my hair or I'm going to pick at my nails. Those are stems. Yeah. They're just not as big or noticeable as me flapping my hands and twirling around. Yeah. And there's a lot of history behind, you know, why that is. And yet kind of, there are also things that we may be encouraging people to suppress, which then if we're not, again, introducing a alternative, those emotions are going to get extremely dysregulated or could get extremely dysregulated. It's okay. something that we really also want to notice on our clients, because if somebody has been saying, been told their whole life, quiet hands, quiet hands, and they're sitting there in your office kind of rigidly looking at you and they almost seem kind of stuck or you can encourage movement. You can say, hey, why don't we get up? Why don't we uh, do something to see if maybe that what's the problem? Mm -hmm. Very good, very interesting. So I'm aware we only have a few minutes and I wonder if we could just like zoom a little bit more quickly through the, the last four of our top 10. Is that okay with you? Okay. Guys? Yeah, and also if we're doing another podcast to get to the to the skills and adaptation, we if there's something we leave out here, you can throw it in there too. Oh, for sure. Okay, well, let me jump in with number seven. So increased structure. Um, generally, autistic people do feel more comfortable with um, more structure as long as it makes sense to us. Now, DBT can be pretty structured, but there can also be really vague aspects where we sort of do sort of subtle dance kind of back and forth type of thing. And that can be, that part can be really confusing to, I would say both autistic clients and therapists, but I would say, you know, have clear structure and be really collaborative about it. Now it doesn't mean that each client can just totally choose their own entire structure of the therapy, but ask if they have any questions about why we do that. Um, you know, a lot of times autistic people ask a lot of questions about rules, the, but the reasons behind rules don't necessarily make sense to us, but we really need to know the reasons behind rules. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard like elementary school teachers complaining about why this kid just asks all these questions about the rules and they're being non-compliant and, you know, resistant and blah, blah, blah. And it's really just that we need to know it needs to make sense. You know, just arbitrary authoritarian structures don't really make any sense to a lot of autistic people. Um, and so let's not make DBT another experience like that. Uh, let's really uh, invite, you know, be consistent, be structured, provide as much structure as they need, and um, really invite questions about why that structure exists and not consider that sort of a threat or a challenge or anything like that, but really just curiosity, like Rachel was saying, invite and reward all the questions as we were talking earlier. Um, so I think I'm going to, I'm going to cut myself off there and hand it over to Rachel to talk yes. about, uh, number eight. So the eighth thing we had identified is something that would be one of our top 10 is essentially it, it's what we call spins, but we're special interests, which, um, is defined because we talk about autistic folks and their stims and spins, one of those catchphrases. And, uh, what is a special interest? Well, a lot of times autistic folks have a very very strong interest in one or more areas 
that for some people can be extremely and sometimes oddly specific. Um, historically, therapists have created goals that actually penalize folks for having these interests. So there'll be a goal to not discuss them or to only use them as a reward system after that client has done what the therapist's agenda was. And again, with us kind of unlearning and understanding that these interests um, can actually be utilized very effectively. Um, we can use them to develop rapport. We may be like the only person in that person's life who will actually talk to them about Pokemon or whatever their interest is. Um, even if you don't know anything about the topic, because like, how can we know all of the details about someone's oddly specific special interest in like, for me, it's roller coaster, linear induction, uh, launch system, right? Uh, linear induction motor. So like, how can we do that? Well, it, it's okay to like not know, right? <laughs> Sometimes actually educating the therapist can help the client because they, they, this person wants to know me. And it puts, uh, you know, there's these studies that it puts uh, autistic folks into this flow state that was big in like the 70s. And it's the thing. And when we're introducing this flow state, we can also utilize it like, um, for example, doing grounding work after trauma work. If you're doing prolonged exposure and your client is still kind of up in that higher suds area, um, it can be, you can say, tell me about Pokemon. You know, and again, you're going to discuss this ahead of time with the client. Is this grounding for you? And it can be also helpful to transition out of therapy of, into their real life after they've done maybe some trauma work. Um, and then finally, we can use these interests, depending on what it is, as metaphor, or projecting real life situations on the characters to help better understand the skills. We can use them. Um, and I think it's really important that we understand those. Also, finally, if this client really wants to connect with other people and they just don't know how, that is really a place to start, that they can connect with others who have this shared special interest so they have things to talk about and potentially have a similar neurotype. For sure. All right, um, I'm gonna do number nine, which is to provide more executive function supports. Then wait, so executive functions, kind of how we align um, our, behavior with our goals, as most of us know, but um, also a lot of autistic folks do struggle with executive functions. This would be like kind of organization planning, keeping track of things, that sort of thing. And there's a lot of organizational and executive functioning demands in DBT. So we can help through things like providing information and in writing, like a written agenda and written homework, as opposed to just saying something out loud and expecting people to capture it in that moment. Um, giving people reminders, helping break down large tasks into smaller ones if it feels overwhelming to them, um, perhaps recording teaching parts of a group in case parts were missed, um, modifying their diary card if needed, as Rachel was suggesting earlier. Um, so just thinking about ways that we can provide executive functioning support so that that is not a barrier to people participating in DBT. And uh, last, Rachel, number 10. Yeah, number 10 is kind of the big one that kind of brings it all together, which is learning from autistic people. Not just who we refer to as top experts in textbook DBT. Autistic people are the experts in their own experience. And I'm not just talking about learning from your clients because, no. Um, we are learning, we, we can put together um, and send for the link to the show notes, if you have those, um, a list of some helpful resources, books written by autistic psychologists, therapists, um, trainings created by autistic folks um, in DBT and non-DBT topics uh, having to do with therapy, um, and just autistic culture, videos, TikTok, social media. There is a whole lot out there and a whole lot you can learn from the source rather than somebody who is interpreting, projecting, um, and potentially doing some harmful work when they're talking about folks as an outsider, potentially. Um, we do highly, highly encourage folks to seek consultation from autistic DBT therapists. There's quite a few out there, including myself, uh, Dr. Brooke, um, and you know who do these consultations who can talk to you about where you're getting stuck what might be going on and really adapting your dbt work to the client in front of you wow i, I you guys um let me tell you your ex own executive functioning really outstrips mine you just you, you the last few minutes you got through these last 
things to get through 10, 10 uh, tips. So thank you. I, I, I'm just, I think I'll be really interested in the feedback about this podcast from people as they hear it, because I think you've just, you guys have touched on so many things that are, would be of broad interest. I mean, one of the things that's interesting when you adapt DBT to any population, any culture, any different age group, uh, any, anything like this, is that when you adapt, then you start to get to know DBT better. You also um, come up with things that actually bounce back into standard DBT. So when, when DBT was adapted to adolescents and families and a new mod skills module was developed called walking the middle path, which had to do with being dialectical, um, that sat out there as an adaptation to families and adolescents. But then Linehan saw that and thought, wow, that's really important, that's really good. And then she incorporated it into the interpersonal skills module as walking the middle path skills. And so every time you adapt DBT, it bounces back, it, new things are discovered and it bounces back into standard. So there's a lot of things here. This is what I mean I'll be interested in. It's affected me this way just in hearing you. And so I, I, I look forward to more, more of this. And let me just close by saying a couple of things to people that are, first of all, Please, 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 wherever you listen to the podcast or if you watch it, uh, wherever you can, can you please rate it and review it? Uh, then we find out how we're doing. We find out what's missing. We find out what works and, and, and leave comments. You can do that at Spotify. You can do that at Apple Podcasts. You can do that on my website. And if you want to get a more personal like a, a longer message, you could get it to me through my website on my email through the website. It's very easy to access me. And then I get that and, and I can actually send things like that on to, to Rachel and to Amara if, if that was appropriate. Um, so please, uh, please let me know what you think, including suggestions of other things to go over in the podcast. Um, and then I just want to uh, underline what Rachel was saying. I mean, these two people with me are experts in consulting to people who are working with autistic folks. So if you're struggling with that, or if you want to know more about that, or if you want to even set up a training about something like that, I mean, I don't know if they're available for that, but so I may be volunteering them when they're not actually wouldn't volunteer themselves, but I want to let you know if you could reach out through me if you want to, and I can get any messages to them. Um, Okay, and, and we will have another podcast that's going to focus specifically on the use of DBT skills. I look forward to that one because um, we kind of left that aside for now. And, um, uh, and, and I think we'll link to the podcast on my website. We'll link uh, notes that can include some of the books or authors that uh, Rachel was just alluding to so that you have access to those if you want to check those out. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Amara and Rachel. I really appreciate this. I look forward to listening to this again myself because I think so much just went by that I could only take so much in at once. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie, for having us. This has been a real pleasure and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and um, get the word out about some of these uh, things that are really needed. Very good. Bye. I'm just going to piggyback on that. Like, thank you so much for this opportunity and, and letting us talk freely about it. So I think it's very, very important. Great. All right. So we'll stop here and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll be announcing when the next podcast is, but this, this uh, uh, probably be, be coming out in about a week or so, but I don't want to guarantee that because it depends on other scheduling factors, but sometime soon. All right. Bye everybody.